Today, Earl Erskine and I will be talking about Joseph Smith's 23rd and 24th plural wives next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age, but she ran away. That girl was me. I was lost. Then Jesus Christ found me. I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in Him. Earl and I both welcome and thank you for watching our show. We have been presenting in past shows the wives of Joseph Smith from time to time, and we'll continue until each wife uh, is covered, and we've discussed each one individual, uh, all of his 33 plural wives. The last wife we discussed was number 22, who was 17-year-old Lucy Walker. This time we're going to cover two of his plural wives who were also teenagers, and they were sisters. The story also includes a questionable financial entanglement that was wrapped up in Smith's association with these particular plural wives and their family. They were the Lawrence sisters, and they were wives number 23 and 24. Now, Sarah Lawrence was 17 years old, and her sister Maria was 19 years old, and Joseph Smith married both sisters in May of 1843. Well, just a few days after Joseph Smith had married Lucy uh, Walker, he married the Partridge sisters for the second time. And on that same day that he married the Partridge sisters, he also married both Sarah and Maria Lawrence. He was 37 years old, twice, actually more than twice the age of those teenage girls. So within just a few days of each other, Joseph Smith took five more <laughs> wives, and they included two sets of sisters, and all but one of them were teenagers. Sarah and Maria's father's name was Edward, who died soon after the family had converted to Mormonism and had moved to Illinois, and he had a lot of money, and he left a considerable inheritance to his family. Now, for today's show, we used information from two historical books, Mormon Polygamy by Richard Van Wagner and In Sacred Loneliness by Todd Compton. We have a quote from In Sacred Loneliness. I'm from page 474. It says, Under his will, his wife received a third of the inheritance, and the rest was to be split among the heirs. However, a legal guardian was required for the family. A legal guardian. Now, Joseph Smith, <laughs> being the opportunist that he was, he managed to get himself appointed as the legal guardian of their children and trustee of the estate. So, in essence, Joseph Smith knew an opportunity when he saw it, <laughs> took financial van advantage of and married the Lawrence sisters. Not only was he guardian of their estate, they were also his stepdaughters in the sense that he was their legal guardian and they were living in his home. Mm, another quote. In June 1841, he was appointed guardian of the minor heirs of Edward Lawrence and trustees for their estate. William Law and Hiram Smith were made bondsmen to Joseph. <laughs> okay, so the girls continued living in Joseph Smith's home even after his plural wives Emily and Eliza Partridge had been forced to leave when Emma discovered her husband's plural marriages included sex. But Emma was probably unaware of her husband's marriage to the Lawrence sisters. Well, after the girl's father, Edward, died, his widow remarried a man named Josiah Butterfield. And together, the girl's mother and her new husband worked to get back the rights to Edward's estate. <laughs> and during that process, Josiah and Joseph Smith had quite a disagreement over it. <laughs> we quote. From page 475, tension began to simmer between Joseph and Josiah Butterfield until it erupted into violence. According to the history of the church, Josiah Butterfield came to my house and insulted me so outrageously that I kicked him out of the house across the yard and into the street. <laughs> well, he probably said to Joseph Smith's face what was true, how he yeah. was a deceiver. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, more than once, Joseph Smith bragged about the violence that he meted Sounds out like to those who spoke out against him. And, of course, more evidence that he did not behave like a true prophet of God yeah. 
would or should behave in such circumstances. But then again, a true prophet would not have gotten himself <laughs> into those circumstances. That's true too. <laughs> Although his marriages to the Lawrence sisters doesn't have a lot of written history, there is enough information to know for certain that he did marry the two girls and they never received all their inheritance money. The fact that Smith married his legal teenage dependents created a huge outrage in the city from those who were already disgusted with Joseph Smith's immoral marriage practices. History of the Church, Volume 5, pages 52 through 54, discusses Smith's phrenology, which was also published in the LDS publication, The Wasp, on July 2nd, 1843. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this as being a former Mormon, no. but I, I checked this out, and it's in the History of the Church, Volume 5. Now, because we present this information doesn't indicate we support phrenology, but it is interesting that the History of the Church publication published it and is still in it. But the phrenology shows that Joseph Smith had a legendary attraction to women, that he was highly susceptible and passionately fond of, be <laughs> <laughs> of being in the company of the opposite sex, and that someone who scores that high on their chart indicates extreme liability to perversion. Hmm. Well, an extreme liability to perversion certainly describes what we know about Joseph Smith throughout Mormon's own history. For instance, Steve Benson, who is the former president of LDS, uh, president's grandson, grandson yeah. he has a blog, and he writes this in his blog. <laughs> uh, perversion is right. Smith's moves to seduce other men's wives were so brazen and notorious that they led one distraught husband, Orson Pratt, to attempt suicide in Nauvoo on July 15, 1842. Thousands of Nauvoo Mormons searched for Orson Pratt after discovering a suicide note. They found him distraught because Smith, according to Pratt's wife, had tried to seduce Pratt's wife, Sarah. Yeah, wow. and that's perversion. And he did. He did that with more than one married, already married women that he was friends yeah. with their husband. Well, Joseph Smith continued to control the Lawrence estate. <clears throat> and at some point he considered transferring it into the guardianship of John Taylor, but that never happened. Now, the following year, the secrecy of Joseph Smith's polygamy really began to unravel. Josiah Butterfield, who was the husband of the Lawrence sister's mother, she had remarried him, he had questioned Smith's handling of their inheritance, and so he was sent off on a mission to Maine. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> That's easy to take care of. So one of Smith's problems was out of the way, since Josiah could no longer question Smith's handling of the Lawrence inheritance. But William Law discovered Joseph Smith's plural marriage to the Lawrence sisters. Now, he was bondsman for yeah, Joseph Smith to be their guardian, so he has an interest in this. And we also need to remember that he was also a trusted second counselor to the first presidency. So William Law and Joseph Smith's relationship began to suffer tremendously through these events, we quote. Law, who had known the Lawrence family since their conversion in Canada, chose the marriage of Smith and Maria Lawrence as a test case with which to prosecute Smith for adultery. On May 23rd, he filed suit against the Mormon leader, charging that Smith had been living with Maria Lawrence in an open state of adultery from October 12, 1843 to the day of the suit. Okay, so now they're bringing in, wow. they found out about the polygamy, so they're bringing this adultery into yeah. it. And she's a young teenage girl, you know, so, so it's, it's going to be kind of hard on her too as well. But Joseph Smith has, wants to be protected <laughs> in all this as well. Sure. Uh, Maria Lawrence was Joseph Smith's plural wife, but she was also his foster daughter. She was a teenage orphan and he was trustee of her inheritance. This was a very convoluted and complicated mm -hmm. conflict of interest, and Joseph Smith was well aware of it. Well, William Law may actually have hoped that making public this situation uh, with the Lawrence sisters might cause Joseph Smith to give up polygamy for good, but instead, Joseph Smith excommunicated him in front of a church meeting on May 26, 1844, and at this time, Joseph Smith again flatly denied his polygamous practices. We quote from the book entitled Mormon Polygamy. Yeah, this is page 66. 
Another indictment has been got up against me. I had not been married scarcely five minutes before it was reported that I had seven wives. What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one. And by this time, <laughs> I think he had all 33 plural wives. I shall not bear false witness. <laughs> <laughs> that and a few other commandments. Yeah. Well, this uproar took place about a year after he had married the Lawrence sisters. He'd already been married to him for about a year. So he had all these plural wives. And it began a chain of events that subsequently led to the arrest and the death of Joseph Smith. Well, Walter Cox said, Oh, what a tangled <laughs> web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Uh -huh. That it describes Joseph Smith's situation precisely. He was caught in his own web of deceit. But he didn't stop. No, in fact, it got worse. It got the worse, yeah. yeah. And in the end, you know, Joseph Smith really was not a martyr at all for, uh, for uh, you know, for the only true church, shedding his right. blood for the only true church. He was exposed as a lawbreaker, a deceiver, a liar, and a false prophet. It all ended in a fiery gun battle in his jail cell when he wounded, and some accounts claim he even killed a couple of the men he wounded. Um, polygamy was illegal, so Joseph Smith had only two choices either admit it and get into trouble or continue to deny it. Well, his credibility took a beating, yet we wonder, did he really think, I, you know, I wonder this quite frequently, did he really think that he could greedily take so many so plural many wives, yeah. some of them in their early teens, even marrying multiple wives in a single day, marrying other men's legally married wives and keep it all a secret forever? Yeah, especially when you're dealing with people I mean, in a, a small knit community really. and who are watching him closely all yeah. the time you yeah. know he was in a high position so yeah. he was watched Very visible sure. right joseph smith and his counselors decided to counter attack the lawsuit by prosecuting william law for slandering maria lawrence and he dropped William Law from the first presidency, yeah. and Law objected on the grounds that it was God who appointed him. <laughs> William Law said this, For it is illegal inasmuch as I was appointed by revelation, so-called, <laughs> first, and was sustained twice by a unanimous vote of the General Conference. So he's right. If these high positions were filled by revelation from God, <laughs> how can, in the anger of a man, just They'd be super rescinded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, that was William Law. He, he had a head on his shoulders, didn't he? Yeah. Well, William Law said that he could not fellowship with a man who practiced the abominations that Joseph Smith was involved in, so he was glad to be free of him. And of course, we must remember the Book of Mormon labels polygamy as an abomination. Well, some church leaders tried to reconcile with William Law, but he said, Polygamy must first be purged from the church. Now, 10 days after he, his wife Jane, and his brother Wilson were, they were all excommunicated. 10 days later, they founded a separatist church declaring Joseph Smith a fallen prophet. It says this on page 67 of Van Wagner's book. The group issued a prospectus for an opposition newspaper. The Nauvoo Expositor. Citizens were forewarned that the paper would advocate repeal of the Nauvoo Charter, foster religious tolerance and freedom of speech, censure gross moral imperfections, and oppose union of church and state in Nauvoo civil government. Now, I bet you this isn't in your gospel doctrine classes <laughs> no. when you read about early Mormon history because it's no. totally, totally no. subverted or whatever. Anyway, our polygamists and our LDS viewers need to note here that everything that William Law said his paper would support were the very things that Mormons were not doing at the time. There was gross immorality in their practice of polygamy. There was no religious tolerance except for other Mormons. There was no freedom of speech in the Mormon religious environment, and Nauvoo <laughs> was being administered by Mormons for Mormons as a theocracy. Yeah, it's no separation of church right. and state. Right, and I think at that time, uh, Joseph Smith was the mayor of Nauvoo, too. And the general of the army. <laughs> <laughs> the general, yeah. <laughs> William Law planned to give full details and candidly report 
the facts in his paper. He was going to publish the Nauvoo Expositor. Joseph Smith was concerned about the promised disclosures coming out in that newspaper, but William Law would not be talked out of something with his plans of exposure unless some conditions were met, we quote. And it says that Joseph Smith would acknowledge publicly that he had taught and practiced the doctrine of plurality of wives, that he had brought a revelation supporting the doctrine, and that he should own the whole system, revelation and all, to be from hell. Whoa, that's <laughs> yeah. pretty strong stuff, isn't that's it? That's what he wanted him to say. That's what he wanted yeah. him to say in order to not continue on with his plans right. to expose him in the newspaper. William Law also wrote in his journal that Joseph Smith had tried to seduce his own wife to become one of his plural wives, yeah. his, his name, his, her, his wife's name was Jane, but he said she was a virtuous woman and turned Joseph Smith away. Well, true to his word, when the expositor was printed, it charged Joseph Smith as a fallen prophet who had introduced heretical and damnable doctrines, such as plurality of gods. Yeah. above the God of the universe and the plurality of wives and that Smith and other church leaders should be denounced as apostates. Note that they considered it heretical yeah. to believe in multiple gods and multiple it? wives. Yeah. Exactly. Some of you have been reading their Bible. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. It makes you wonder uh, where he was at with that. Well, anyway, Joseph Smith ordered the expositor be destroyed. Rather than own up to his deceit, he broke another law, freedom yeah. of speech, right? Freedom of the press. Right. And that led to his arrest on June 27th of 1844 while he and his brother Hiram and John Taylor were in jail. A mob attacked and in a fiery gun battle, Hiram was killed and Joseph Smith was also shot and killed. And John Taylor was there and he was wounded. Yeah. Of course, he wasn't killed. Right. Um, now, Joseph Smith did not go to his death as a lamb to the slaughter, as Mormon myth claims. He died defending himself against the mob, which itself isn't wrong. No. We, we can't wrong cite that as being something wrong. But it is wrong to lie about what really happened. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> well, Joseph Smith left behind 34 widows. Maria and Sarah Lawrence were two of them, and their estate had never been reconciled nor their inheritance given over to them. After Joseph Smith was killed, questions came up about how much money the Smith estate owned to the Lawrence sisters, owed to the Lawrence sisters. And Joseph Smith's assets, by the way, had all been put in Emma's name, mm. and Emma refused to give them their inheritance. Mm. And they couldn't sue her for it because it wasn't, between her and them. It was Joseph between him and Smith, them. Yeah. And the amount they still were owed was $5,000. Now, I don't know how much that'd be in today's money, but it would be a lot yeah, of money be, in probably. today's money. Yeah. Well, because of all of Joseph Smith's property had been in Emma's name, she couldn't legally sue for it. But William Law, you know, being the bondsman, um, ended up paying out of his own pocket oh, the did. sum of money to Maria and Sarah. So they did get their money back at his expense. From William we, Law. We quote from In Sacred yeah. Loneliness. Law blamed both Joseph and Emma for fraudulently taking possession of the Lawrence estate, but perhaps Emma was less to blame. Joseph may have already borrowed the funds while alive, and Emma may not have had the money to pay back after his death. Okay, and that's conjecture on his part, yeah. but, you know, we don't know, really. But many of Smith's widows were swooped up by Heber, <laughs> C. Kimball, and Brigham Young. Sarah Lawrence married Kimball, becoming his 13th wife, and Maria became the 16th wife of Brigham Young, but she remained sealed to, to Joseph Smith for eternity. But I find this part very interesting. Later, Maria Lawrence changed her mind about being married to, to Brigham Young, and she left him and married Colonel A.W. Babbitt. She did not go west with the Mormons because her husband had been assigned to stay in Nauvoo, and she, and she eventually had a child, and she died in 1847 oh. at a young, uh, yeah, a young she age. she would have been young. But a friend who knew her wrote that Maria had told her aunt that if there was any truth in Mormonism, she would be saved, but she said her yoke was not easy and her <laughs> burden was not light. Maria suffered doubts and fears and uncertainty in her conscience whether she had acted morally right or wrong in her choices, we quote. So died one of the least documented of Joseph's certain wives, suffering from a deep sorrow of unknown causes 
nameless doubts and ethical uncertainties. So she doubted. She was tormented yeah. Yeah. by her moral decisions and she rightfully doubted the unethical and immoral practices of Mormonism, especially polygamy. Sure. She had been the one named in the adultery lawsuit against Joseph Smith, so it must have been a very difficult time for her yeah. in her young age. Being so young. Uh, yeah, um, and all because Joseph Smith said God required polygamy. <laughs> well, now her sister Sarah did go west with the Mormons, and her story also takes a sad turn. A dark side of Sarah seems to appear about this time, at least as recorded by a couple of her peers. Helen Mar Kimball was a friend of Sarah Lawrence, and they were both widows of Joseph Smith, <laughs> and Sarah had married Helen's father. But Helen claimed that Sarah had a jealous nature that she gave into. Helen Mar Kimball was a contemporary, a peer of Sarah, but she had also been a sister wife. Both of them had been married to Joseph Smith. Helen had experienced her own pain and loneliness of being a plural wife at such a young age. So shouldn't she have had been more compassionate and understanding so. yeah. of what a plural wife must suffer? Why would she have been so condemning against Sarah, I wonder? So, so she was so harsh in her judgment of a, of a fellow sufferer. Sarah was also Helen's stepmother, but her marriage to Kimball was not working, so she seriously considered a divorce. We quote Helen's concerns. Yeah, this is page 481. Had a few words with Sarah. She still seems inclined to disconnect herself with Brother K. Kimball. I advised her to behave to Brother Kimball as a wife, and then she would realize a very different feeling. Yeah, based on feelings here rather <laughs> yeah. than on God's word. But anyway, Sarah was done with plural marriage and asked for a divorce and received it in June 18, 1851, according to records, and the divorce, the divorce was a friendly one. She met and married a man named Joseph Mount, and he had some money that he had made while working in the gold fields of California. Later, they moved as a couple to California, and because of her move away from plural marriage and from Mormon Utah, she was spoken about in negative terms. According <laughs> to the Mormons, she denied the faith when she moved to California with her new husband. Now, without being too harsh, I, I don't want to be too harsh, but I also want to make a couple of observations about the negativity surrounding Sarah's rejection of plural marriage and the Mormonism that invented it. I have found through experience from many people and from many people with whom I've spoken that the early Mormon plural wives would judge very harshly those who left polygamy just of plural wives do the same today. They have set their own standards of how women should act and react in any and every circumstance surrounding the doctrine and practice of plural marriage. And some of them say some very harsh and condemning statements against a woman who walks away from polygamy. You know, they'll often gossip with each yeah. other yeah. and they'll run their reputations into the ground of the one who left. It happens all the time now. And evidently, it certainly happened with Sarah, according to, and there's more detail than we can put here. So you say it show. happens even now. In oh, yeah. Sarah. Well, it does in the Mormon church when somebody well, leaves. What do they do? They <laughs> yeah. shred their reputation. Yeah, and shun them. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and shun them. And then figure you've sinned or done something wrong. Yeah. Uh, but what amazes me is that Helen Mark Kimball would do it because she yeah. herself complained in her own diary yeah. of, of the, what she had to go through to that become such a plural wife at that age. But she was duped into plural marriage and she was, she was true to it, clear to the end of days. And so she thought everyone else should be too. Um, but you know, gossip is nothing less than deadly, emotionally <laughs> kill. That's it's true. one of the seven deadly sins they talk about in the Bible. And any female who questions or doubts polygamy or leaves polygamy becomes the victim of their malicious and venomous tongues. And as I read the story of Sarah Lawrence and the judgmental remarks made about her by Helen Mark Kimballs and others, I sensed the same judgmental attitude, like I said, between someone, uh, from someone who walks away from polygamy. Uh, mothers will be awful to their daughters, and, and fathers will disown them, and so on. It's awful. And of course, this is my personal evaluation, uh, because I've seen it many times. None of the books that we quote from has, has said that in yeah. their book. Also, we need to know that Sarah Lawrence was suffering from uterine cancer, which could be one of the reasons for an attitude 
uh, that she had an attitude that her peers were complaining about. She died from the disease mm -hmm. in San Francisco at the young age of 46 in November of 1872. So she was young yeah. as well when she died. Interesting. And we read both the stories of Sarah and Maria, and they're tragic, they're ruined lives, they're sad lives that they lived. Well, they caught, got caught up in Joseph's polygamy, and then when he dies, then they're, I mean, where, where else are they going to do? What are they going to do? So exactly. They, and then Heber C. Kimball and the other leaders, Brigham Young, would take them and... Mm -hmm. And they swoop in with the same rhetoric. You have to marry me. You have to stay in, in this to save your soul and, yeah. you know, to go to heaven and to see Joseph Smith again and all this. But uh, the, 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 I think what, it, it bothers me. It really bothers me a lot, um, especially when two young lives like these are so ruined. You know, they're just so, um, th they could have been made into something more beautiful than what happened. Well, it's amazing to me that he would do th five women in like a few days. Within a period. few days, yeah, yeah. five and, wives. I mean, like you said, how could he keep that secret? But it just what's the the mentality that that requires, or t I mean, you how know, do you talk I, people into that? I think with this kind of you know all this kind of sexual activity, enough is never enough. That may be. I think enough is never enough. They always it's have to have conquest, something new, something it's more. It's always moving. Something you know. more, yeah, I believe mm -hmm. so. And I think of Maria. Uh, the, when I read about her, she she was questioning the ethical, the moral decision that she made to go into polygamy. Yeah. And and I think that it was, was it, of course, she married Babbitt, and maybe she fell in love with him. It doesn't say about a love story, but... She evidently didn't want Brigham Young for a no. husband. Yeah. And maybe at that point, her conscience was really nagging her, saying, this really isn't right. Doesn't feel like it's from God. Yeah. 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 It's possible. Anyway. So that's the story of Mar Maria and, and um, Sarah Lawrence. And our next plural wife that we talk about will be Helen Mark Kimball. Mm. Thanks. And she was young. And she was 14. Yeah. 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 Almost 15. <laughs> Okay. You know, Jesus said that in this world we would have troubles, but to take heart because he has overcome the world. You know, he never said once that polygamy helps us overcome the world or overcome te te temptation or jealousies or anything else. Jesus is the Savior, and if polygamy was part of the salvation process for anyone, the Savior would have said so, but he didn't. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ, not in polygamy. No one's real hope can be in polygamy. When we face God on Judgment Day, He will not ask if you were in polygamy or if you rejected polygamy. He will ask, were you in Jesus Christ? Or did you reject Jesus for someone else or something else or reject Him for nothing? Well, forget polygamy. Forsake it and turn from it and take Jesus because He is all we need. Thank you.